right? We have the power, we are empowered, and we can leverage that power to create success. So thank you so much. <laughs> Our next session today is going to speak to the importance of another set of stakeholders in our careers. Um, as we know, women are the majority of our workforce. And, but we did, and we did not create the system that we're all experiencing. We did not create the bias or the male privilege that we've learned to work around, that we've learned to work through, we've learned to jump over, we've learned to do a lot of different things, <laughs> right? Um, but it's work, it takes a lot of work. And that work, our leadership, us as Latinas, we require the support of others to ma also make this possible, specifically men. And so that's why I'm so excited about our next conversation, engaging men as inclusion allies. I had the pleasure of speaking with many of our panelists last night at the reception, and I can tell you they get it, I unequivocally get it. They get the importance of supporting us. Um, to lead the discussion on including men as allies and representing our platinum sponsor of this event, PepsiCo, is the Vice President and General Manager, Hispanic Business Unit, Unit Esperanza Teasdale, who we heard from yesterday. Esperanza? All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, great to see you again. So we're gonna have a really great panel today. Um, I would like to uh, introduce these three incredibly talented gentlemen to come on up here. Uh, Mr. Jorge Salguero, America's leader for Deloitte US and US global leader for Deloitte Risk and Financial Advisory. Senor. <laughs> Mr. Willy Rivero, Senior Vice President of Automotive Fleet Maintenance and Engineering at UPS. And Mr. Jorge Herrera, Independent Director of the Board of Directors of Travel and Leisure Company, where he serves as Chairman of the Governance Committee and is also a member of the Audit Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Bienvenido. So, um, quickly, a minute, say something about yourself. So, Vice President of UPS, been around for 30 years, seen a lot of things, but I'm most proud of uh, the people that I lead at UPS. Over 5,000 that really keep our fleet running. Also very proud of the fact that I lead a group of executive leaders that sponsor uh, employee resource groups. Over 1,000 strong, 18 different chapters at UPS, and there's a lot of great things happening at UPS in the last few years. Awesome, look forward to hearing about that. Uh, Jorge. Um, so thank you for the invitation, and thank you for sharing the stage. Uh, with all of you, partner at Deloitte. Um, I serve clients in several industries, um, quite frankly, helping them solve their most critical business issues. Um, I serve as the America's leader, as Esperanza mentioned. Um, and one of the uh, most exciting things I've ever done is I, I served on the board of directors of the US firm uh, of Deloitte, which is how I got introduced to, um, to Sid and to Acer um, personally. I've been married to my middle school sweetheart since then, not since then, since uh, <laughs> we have her at 23. Um, but we're still married. She's actually here somewhere in the hotel. Um, and last year, both my kids, adult kids, got married um, three months apart from each other. Um, I don't recommend it. Uh, <laughs> not only because of the money, because we were going through a pandemic and it was, it was quite interesting to, but it, there were beautiful weddings and, and they're, you know, they're my pride and joy. So. Great. Jorge. And George. Buenos dias. Uh, happy to be here. I'm a member of the Board of Directors of Travel and Leisure Company, and I know Sid for about 60 years. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Only kidding. <laughs> but I do know Sid for a very, very long time. And uh, great to be here. Um, always happy to be around Latinas, having been raised by my mom. I have two sisters. I'm married, and I have three daughters. <laughs> so, so I know que, que, quien tiene el poder en la casa, oh, la, la Latina. So I. I get it, and, and two are married, and, and one uh, graduates in May from the University of Miami, so she'll be entering you know, the labor force real soon. I'm a past president and CEO of the U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, where I served for about five and a half, six years. I've served on four public company boards, and uh, 
I did create the first ever Hispanic uh, English language television show that was called Hispanics Today that aired for about eight years on NBC. And it was created in, <laughs> it was, uh, it was created way back when it wasn't uh, fashionable for us to have TV shows, but it was created in 1998 uh, under the auspices of the, uh, of the U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. It's un placer to be here today. Great. All right, well, let's get right into it. So we want to talk about how the, your companies define allyship. And Jorge, you mentioned um, that this is the year of allyship at Deloitte, and your company's definitely been very vocal about holding itself accountable. So can you talk a little bit about the year of allyship? Yeah, look, indeed. Um, we we um, have realized that allyship is, is critical to, to all groups. Um, and we define it, quite frankly, and, and I love the panel a little earlier when, when someone talked about authenticity. But authenticity um, comes with being able to empathize and understand um, everybody's uh, dynamics. Um, whether it's through um, you know, a, a connection that occurred um, be, between you and, and, and the individual, or somebody confided in you that, that they really you know, weren't getting the allyship they needed and so forth. And so we, you know, we've embarked on, on a process where we're providing resources to, to our professionals to help them um, understand and become good allies uh, for, for all groups. Personally, I'll, I'll tell you, um, as I've seen allyship, and, and people call it different things sometimes, but as I've seen allyship in, in my career and those that were allies to me and, and, and folks that I've been allied to, there's several things that are pretty common. Number one, the relationship has to be natural. And someone talked about that up, up here in one of the panels, uh, in the panel earlier. Um, there's gotta be an affinity between the person that's providing the allyship and the person that, that, that's receiving it. Um, second, it has to be intentional. Like we, we have to, w once we become the ally, we have to publicly and privately intentionally um, use our voice whatever that voice may be in whatever form that may be, um, to ensure that we're providing um, that, that support. You know, an example is, is I'm an ally for, for a professional for, for many years, um, and, and she was timid at first in, in speaking in her mind and so forth, so I made it a point to call her out in every meeting we were together and to say, you need, you need to express your point of view. I made it a point. Um, and sometimes I actually didn't show up to the meeting. I, I said, you're on your own, <laughs> may, may, make it happen. Um, third, it, it has to be consistent. Allyship has to be consistent. It doesn't start and end, it's a journey. It's a lifetime journey. And actually, I, I believe the, the most important piece of allyship is when you've helped someone get to whatever it is, a position that they're aspiring to or something, but, but continuing that allyship after they've reached whatever they call their destination, which by the way, I don't think there's ever a destination. We're, we're always on a journey. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, um, you know, what I would say is it has to be broad. You know, sometimes we're being allies to women, to Latina women. Sometimes we're being allies to other groups. And the important thing about what we're trying to do is, is we're trying to advance equity in the room. Mm -hmm. We need the room to be equitable in order to, to advance. That's a great thing to remember. Um, Willie, uh, there's been a lot of positive changes at UPS, especially on the racial equality journey, new female CEO. So you talked about some great things that have changed since then. Can you share that? Absolutely. Um, so just think back, um, April 2020, we had a new CEO. We have a pandemic, economic downturn, and racial injustice. And Carol Tomei comes in, not the first female to be a UPS CEO, but also the first outsider. A company that's been around for 112 years. It's a lot of values at UPS. But what we found out very quickly in, in Carol's first year is that she understood that this history of great company with a lot of values, the behaviors weren't aligned with the values, mm -hmm. particularly when it came down to equality. So what does she do? I think 
Um, we talked about earlier today, UPS is one of those companies that in the last 18 months, we have six board of directors that are women. Prior to that, there was only 20%. Today, out of the 13 members, that's 46% female. In the Woo! <laughs> Big. And uh, along with that, you have an executive leadership team that reports to Carol. 38% of those are female today. And in a very short period of time, we see tremendous movement there. But I think as an organization, one of the things she established first off is she said, do we have equity in pay? Are women getting paid the same? So we had an independent study uh, company that came in, evaluated the pay structure, and made adjustments. Not many, but she ensured that are, are we not only putting them in the right position, but are we paying them as equals? Uh, that was a big step. Uh, a lot of people benefited from that, but I think organizations send a message that says equality is here. Um, and I, I'm, I'm very proud of that, but I, her message is very simple. We're going to be better, not bigger. Mm. And by doing that, she's invested in people first. So I think the, the key for us is we've always been very strong with the shareholders. But what we understand, if you invest in the associates first, you'll take care of the customers, which eventually will take care of the shareholders. And UPS stock, if you haven't seen it, right, has doubled during the pandemic. So we have a new CEO, critical time, a lot of changes, but because we didn't have a blind spot, and she was able to bring it over perspective, we are able to do great things that typically we're in a better shape today than we were two years ago. So, I mean, I could talk for about 20 more minutes, but- We, we can't think, tell you're passionate. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I think uh, just the results speak for themselves. Yeah. Well, it talks about the power of the data too that was discussed before by, by Sarah and the numbers. Um, so George, um, over the years, there's a lot of discussion around women on boards and the diversification of boards. You. Uh, help to change that in one of your organizations. So can you talk about that experience? Well, I joined the Sendin board in 2004, 18, 18 years ago. I think there might have been 20, 20 or 30 Latinos on corporate, on fortune boards at that time. And uh, I say Sendin, people don't know maybe what Sendin was, but they were Fortune 40 company, about $36 billion a year company. We owned Orbitz, Cheap Tickets, Corwell Banker, Avis, uh, Wyndham, hospitality and so on. And when I joined the board, I became the first Hispanic on that board. And um, I was interviewed by the ex prime minister of Canada, Brian Mulroney, who happened to be a member of that board. And uh, when I joined the board, I was 14 members on the board. And uh, I noticed that the board was very, was diversified at that time. We had African Americans on the board. We had women on the board. You know, I became the first Latino on, on the board, but I realized very quickly that, uh, this kid, you know, born to a Boricua mother and a, and a Chilean father from Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, New York, was now sitting in a room with some of the most powerful business people in the world and, and an ex-prime minister of Canada. And he nudged me at my first board meeting and he said, look around the room. And I did. And uh, he says, what do you see? I see. I said, I see a lot of a lot of very wealthy people in the room. And he says, well, welcome. Welcome to this privileged group. And it stuck in my mind. And I said, hmm, privileged group, huh? And what I said to myself very quickly was, I got to see how I can try to navigate myself into a position of power within the board where I can try to effectuate change in terms of diversity and inclusion, in terms of all the different corporate pillars that I felt that our company needed to resemble the customer base. My mantra has always been, uh, from a corporate board perspective, that you know, if we're good enough to do business with you, then we're good enough to sit in the corporate boardroom. We're good enough to be in the C-suite, and we need to make sure that, you know, our company resembles the customer base that we serve. So, uh, you know, it's, it's been, I've been, I think, very blessed that I've always had CEOs who get it, who understood it, who really, really never gave me any friction in terms of trying to move the needle within the company. And I said to myself, uh, I need down the road to try to ascend to become chairman of, of the governance committee. 
because I knew that if I could chair governance, I can call every C-suite person into that boardroom and start asking that executive vice president of HR, give me the numbers. I want to know where we are. Where is my community? Okay, in terms of opportunities. Call in, you know, the, the, the SVP of sourcing. Let's talk about supplier diversity. Are minorities part of the supply chain? Bring in the head of philanthropy. Are we making investments in minority organizations throughout the country? And, you know, uh, lo and behold, in, when we split up the company in 2006, uh, the hospitality division became Wyndham Worldwide, and uh, I was asked to join the board there and became chairman of governance. And, you know, we've been able to really, you know, effectuate change among all of the corporate pillars of, our com of the companies that I've sat on the board. That's great. Having a seat at the table and what you do with it is really important. Exactly. Um, so talk about... Let's just talk for a few minutes about uncomfortable situations that maybe some of you may have been in. Um, Willie, you talked about an example of sponsoring talent and just realizing that they needed exposure as well um, to give them an opportunity um, and leaning into stretch assignments. Like, how, can you share that example with everybody? Absolutely. So, um, you know, UPS, sometimes it takes so many checklists of different job assignments to get to where we're going to go. Uh, but I had an opportunity early on to meet a young lady that was very talented, but wasn't a technical person, but a people person. Tremendous people IQ, did well in all her assignments, but when she got the opportunity to get promoted, we always had a list of things that she didn't do and why she wouldn't get there. So sponsors, I think, we talked a little bit about mentors and sponsors. Um, I think sponsors play a much more vital role. Mentors kind of tell you, this is how I did it, and give you an example of how you should do it. Sponsors walk you along this forest you've never been to and get you to the end of that path. And so when you sponsor people, whether they know it or not, you're helping them get through very difficult situations. I had to help her through that forest of how to navigate to get to where she wanted to go when there was really no one else speaking for her when we're talking about people development and talent meetings. So we all talked about there's probably 75% people making decisions for your career, don't know your culture, don't look like you, don't think like you. Um, there's a difficult challenges to say how I'm gonna take a chance on that person when no one's there to speak for you. So developing these sponsors were critical we were able to, with much hesitation, put her in a position where we gave her a temporary assignment. She did very well, and today, I would tell you, that happened like five years ago. Out of all of the directors I have globally, she's the number one director in fleet maintenance and was never a mechanic. It's, it's an interesting story, uh, but I go back, and we had a retirement uh, two years ago, and I said, let's go back and look at who are the best performing districts in the U.S.? And when I looked at it, she got the Chesapeake. Uh, she was able to be number one. So she was consistently in the top three, top four for the last five years. Never really became the number one. But when you combine the body of work for five years, she was a number one director and never turned a wrench. Uh, and that was a, okay. just a compelling story for us to say, you don't have to make all those checks. If they have the proper capacity to learn, and we could see that she, she was two levels up, we gave her a shot and she's done great. Mm -hmm. It's a great story. So lean into those stretch assignments. Don't be a yeah. hesitant. Um, and George, you, you had a, an example of a very uncomfortable conversation around black talent on a board and a response that you received from other people. Can you share that story? Yeah, well, you know, as again, being an advocate of trying to get diversity on the board, we wanted to, uh, I wanted to, you know, bring on a person of color to the board. I wanted to be, it, I wanted it to be a woman. I wanted it to be a person of color. And, uh, you know, I started, <laughs> one of the board members said to me, well, you know, I'm concerned that if we bring, you know, a, a person of color to the board that they're gonna, you know, if it's an African American, that they're gonna start to think black. And I said, do you mean like how you think white? 
And he says, he says well, what, you know, what, what are you talking about? I says, well, I've been on this board for almost 18 years. Do you think I think Puerto Rican? I, I don't understand exactly what you're saying. So he had to be kind of checked very quickly. And then the other, you know, the other obstacle kind of came, well, you know, there's not a board vacancy. And I'm like, well, we're gonna do what, every, what, what we do when, you wanna, when other companies wanna get someone on the board. Why don't we expand the board so that we can add a woman of color to the board? So again, as chair of governance, you know, you do carry you know, some clout, clout within that kind of dialogue and conversation. And uh, a year and a half ago, we started on the path. Uh, and right away, you know, they were, well, well, who do you know, George? I said, no, 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 it's not gonna be someone I refer. We're gonna go through an extensive search. We're gonna bring in a search firm. We had about 160 candidates. And uh, it so happened that the person that we decided to bring on board was an Afro-Latina. Many of you know, may, may know Lucinda Martinez. I know Sid knows Lucinda. Lucinda served as uh, executive vice president at HBO for about 20 years. Uh, uh, raised in Harlem, Columbia grad, uh, trustee of the Alvin, Alvin Ailey. And she's now uh, vice president of global multicultural branding for Netflix. And uh, we announced uh, at the end of last year that we appointed Lucinda Martinez to the Board of Directors of Travel and Leisure. So we have an Afro-Latina now on the board, you know, due to the, you know, not only to my advocacy Woo! efforts, but... Uh, so when you talk about, you know, allyship and trying, you know, the open doors of opportunities, I knew that there was a void. Uh, you know, we needed to have a woman of color on the board. We did have, you know, we have two other women on the board. One's the ex-CEO of, of, of Red Robin's Restaurants. So, uh, you know, there was no reason at all why we should not have ventured down that path. And, uh, you know, with perseverance, I guess, and, and at least having the credibility to convince the other board members that we should go down that path. You know, I'm very, very excited and happy that Lucinda has joined our board of directors. Amazing. And I, I do believe there is a session on uh, boards and membership coming up. So pay attention, everybody. Sure. Um, and so just last question really for Jorge is around, you know, the business situations where allyship can be of, of help, right? So we talked about supplier diversity, talent, et cetera, but at Deloitte, like, how are you seeing it manifest then across different? Yeah, questions? I mean, like, like I talked about earlier, you know, we're focused on intentionality. Um, and, you know, um, people get nervous um, to talk about the data. Um, and to analyze the data and to understand the data and so forth. So we've taken it a, a, upon our journey to understand the data, to really gather data, because that's when you can become intentional and to be transparent with the data, mm -hmm. not, not to, just to hold it in some room where nobody sees it. And that's leading us to incredible allyship relationships where we, f we find folks that don't feel the love, <laughs> quote, quote unquote, and so how do we how do we use that um, that data and and from a business standpoint, how, do, how does that equate to giving opportunities to bring more folks into the room and have that equity that I talked about earlier? Um, and it's you know it's a, it's a journey. Um, I, I will tell you um, from my standpoint, there's a lot of things I have to unlearn. You know we we get data and it's transparent and and we learn from the data. To me, the most important thing is what we have to unlearn and the biases that we have to eliminate, unconscious biases that we have to eliminate. Mm -hmm. uh, that, to me, is, is quite important about analyzing the data and, and analyzing the business situation. So um, that, that's, those are some of the things we've, we've done. Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, really, thank you all for everything that you're doing. Um, I would encourage everyone here, as you think about who's on your personal board of directors and sitting at the table for you, there's three amazing gentlemen that I'm sure would love to have that role. And, um, and so take advantage of meeting them uh, for your future as well. Um, but yeah, so um, I don't know if there's any questions then that, that we're taking here. Yes, okay. Thank you, Belkis Amick, I'm with uh, Procter & Gamble. Thank you for being here. Um, I think you're here because you get it. You uh, embrace fully diversity and inclusion, and so I'm just curious for 
the room, what would you say is your biggest advice uh, to help men who don't yet get it on their journey? What has really, really gotten through? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm sure we all have opinions. But go ahead. <laughs> I, I could just say, I, I mean, there's a great opportunity for men uh, when you look at sponsorship, reverse mentoring, right? So most of us, you look at us, we're, we're not digital natives, right? So you look at the future for business is digital, understanding how to communicate customers. So for some of you looking to get sponsors and connect with people that will not only be part of your work network, but your personal network, we need both. People that, you, that are connected to you work-wise, that can help you up the ladder. But you also said there was a lot of conversation this morning about somebody that's not in your work environment, that can give you great insight on relocation, what to take in an assignment and why, and really what's your purpose as you move up the ladder of what you really want in the next three years for yourself. Um, a lot of the, the men that I know need reverse mentors. Mm -hmm. That's a great step for you to make deposits so down the road you have withdrawals. Uh, and it's a first step really to ensure that you're seeing a different perspective from that 70% that you don't get to hear about what happens in closed door. That's just one tip. The other thing is, and I would just say, that fear and hope have no space. They can't be in the same space together. You have to pick one. Whenever you take challenging job assignments, we always have fear. And you have to pick hope so that you can get to where you want to go. go um, two, <laughs> two, two things. One, and it, it was said in the panel uh, up here uh, earlier, um, if, if you believe the person that's not um, getting it, I think you said get, getting it, and the lights are um, pretty. Um, just call them out. Um, you, you have to be direct and call them out. And second is, is all of you have the power to be allies. Become allies because through that example, um, people that don't get it are going to be left at the door. So. Hello, Laura James from UPS. And uh, my question to the gentleman on the panel is, in your observations in the work environment, being amongst women, especially um, in rooms or fields or functions where there are mostly men present, what's a common uh, maybe misstep or something that maybe you observe amongst the women in your presence that you think, oh, I wish you know, they would rethink uh, maybe taking that action, that behavior, or a trope that maybe you see uh, women around you fall into that no one is speaking to them about, maybe they haven't been counseled to by other um, mentors or advisors that you wish that they knew or that maybe you thought, oh, I'll speak to them about that, that comes up frequently. Yeah, I, w I would say that you know, some of the times I, you know, I see that I see women sometimes being a little timid and a bit, being a little scared. You know, they're in an environment where they see it's primarily, an, you know, an entire white male right in, environment. And I, I think that you know, you can be aggressive, you can be assertive, you know, and get out of your comfort zone. You know, you gotta you gotta get out of your comfort zone and, and let them know that you know you have you know you have the, the capabilities, you have the experience you know, and you're able to perform at the same level. So many times, again, I just see, you know, that there's some timidness in terms of trying to navigate, and I'm like, Latinas aren't timid, <laughs> you know? <laughs> we're, we're not, you know, you're not timid at all. So I think that, you know, it's a matter of expressing yourself, and then look to see where you can establish some potential mentors, you know, within the company that can take you under the wing, that are willing to work with you, cultivate you, and are willing to, you know, to navigate you throughout that corporate, throughout the corporate structure. I have found that mentors are, are, are very, very important in terms of unlocking the doors of opportunity for people of color within major corporations. And I think you'd be surprised that if you ask someone to mentor you 
what the response will be, because I think many times uh, they're also very careful not maybe wanting to reach out and try to establish that mentor-mentee type of relationship. So I think if, if you take a chance and go out and, you know, and speak to them, and then also, you know, I tell, I tell a lot of people in my community that, you know, from a comfort zone level, we got to start to network outside of our, mm -hmm. of our communities, you know. Don't only go to Latino events or Latina events. You know, you need to get out and go to the events where these, you know, leaders of these corporations are. It may be just a local chamber. It may be a rotary. It may be you're having a golf clinic, right? <laughs> you're having a golf clinic is, you know, just getting out there and learning because, you know, unfortunately in corporate America, you know, a lot of decisions are made, particularly from a board perspective, in terms of who do you know? Who are you comfortable with? You know, many times there's, you know, an opening at the corporation, they'll reach to me and they'll say, George, we want a person of color. You know, recommend someone. And I'll give them five or six names, and that person will come right back to me and says, yeah, these five or six names are good, George. Who should we hire? You know these people. Tell me, who should we really bring into the company? So, you know, it's a matter of, of us, as I said, always getting out of that comfort zone, networking outside of our arena, and then, you know, looking at mentors within the organization to be able to leverage, you know, their visibility, their understanding of how that company functions, and then hopefully have them, you know, uh, guide you along the way. Yeah, and I think the network is really the key, right? So uh, three types of network you need to work on. First, your career network at work, personal network, and a strategic network of where you want to go. And you, you cannot wait to have a job opening to get a network. You, that needs to happen like today because the network needs to be in place so when that opportunity comes in, you're already there. And so often we start to network when we say a job opening or where there's rumors of, hey, there's opportunities to go to the next step. It's probably too late. You need to start early. So if there's one takeaway right from this two-day meeting is get the network started today. Mm -hmm. That's going to give you the job you want tomorrow. Because once you have the skill level and the capacity, as George said, the opportunity is who you know. People like to promote, give opportunities to people they know and have interaction with uh, from a business or personal level. And the more you're connected with that network, the better opportunities you'll have for the jobs that you want. And make sure the network knows what you want. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they'll be shy about it, right? So, yeah. So, and, and like I said, you have to deposit so that you can withdraw when you have that. So be intentional about what is that deposit that you bring. You bring something in so that you can get something later. It's like a bank account. Mm -hmm. So I have one uh, last question from the virtual audience. Um, part of allyship is challenging your own privilege. What is your advice on how to do that? Well, I think it is, is recognizing that, that you have privilege and then that you have, a, that you have the power to effectuate change. Look, you know, in the community, as, and, and I, so, I know Sid laughs at me all the time, I'm a loud mouth as it pertains to advocacy for the Hispanic community in the country, okay? And I have serious problems with Latinos that get into the corporate boardroom and forget that they're Latino. Okay, and they're just concerned about getting, <laughs> and they're just concerned about receiving that quarterly check. Okay, now you you know you usually don't resign from a fortune board. Okay, you're usually aged out, or there's a merger, or there's an acquisition, or something that effectuates that change. So if I'm in the boardroom and I happen to be a Latino, I know that I have privilege. I know that I have power. I also know that my primary responsibility is a fiduciary responsibility to my shareholders. But that does not mean that I should acquiesce my ability to serve as an advocate for my community within that respective corporation. Okay, that's my mantra. And I, you know, every time I, you know, I see a lot of Latino getting on corporate boards, I kind of tell them, listen, man, don't forget where you came from. Don't forget that there's a universe here of Latinos that are, that are looking and aspiring to get where you are. You know, I'm a kid from Brooklyn, Bed-Stuy, New York. I was born in the hood, and, and, and I've had an opportunity. I, I do live in the greatest country in the world, and I've had an opportunity to ascend, to sit on, 
you know, a, a Fortune 40 seat, but at the same time, I want to be able to use the privilege and the power that I have to effectuate change and open up doors for individuals within my, with my community. And I think that's a, re a tremendous responsibility that all Latino board members should hold very, very dear to their heart. Well said. Well said. Well, thank you. Uh, call to action, build your network. So please make sure you do that leaving here today. So thank you very much, George, Jorge, and Willie. And uh, have a great lunch.